I was having y'all, it's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and of course, you know every game I gotta do a review video, but this one is special because what a game man whether you were rooting for us to win or lose i know your heart was in your feet watching that boy it didn't matter what side you was on um so we got to talk about how this game impacted our potential draft position and we'll see by the end of the night where we are because as of right now after that loss if the cardinals and the patriots win we can have the number two overall pick y'all that's crazy so we got to talk about everything because like i said if you were there during the live stream i said it multiple times for the remainder of the season after we were officially eliminated from the playoffs against the rams even before then i was saying we here we are here to evaluate and enjoy ourselves slash laugh we're gonna laugh at our pain yeah we're bad we're gonna go out there and lose games we have no business losing but at the same time, we're here to evaluate players, especially the younger guys. I'm here to evaluate Sam Howe, Quan Martin, KJ Henry, Chris Rodriguez, um, Emmanuel Forbes, which we got to talk about Emmanuel Forbes later on in the video when we get to the DB part of this video. Because again, Ron Rivera has upset me in a lot of different ways, but this contradiction with this Emmanuel Forbes situation is probably the most I've wanted Ron Rivera fired his entire tenure here. The contradiction is ridiculous. It's mind blowing. Clock management, yeah, whatever. Lack of winning lack of ability to, to to find the right talent in the draft and free agency playing is safe with everything yeah that's cool that's all bad but this Emmanuel Forbes situation is probably the thing making me the most upset but of course this is Rico Street score so after every game we're going to do a breakdown of every position group and every coach that contributed like offensive coordinator defensive coordinator which goes in Ron Rivera's category as far as defensive coordinator and we're going to talk about every position group Sam Howell Jacoby Brissett all the wide receivers running backs D-line offensive line everything tight ends so make sure you stay tuned for the entire video because we're going to break down everything including special teams because Jamison Crowder had probably his worst game I've seen in my life of him being for the Burgundy and Gold no matter which stint he was here with the Redskins left and came back now as the Commanders that was one of his worst games it looked like he wanted to tank himself that boy threw up looking like throw him up bust him up the way he fumbled on that punt like it was literally like oh I'm about to get tackled let me go ahead and throw this up there it looked like I don't know if y'all remember playing that in elementary school I don't know what y'all call it from wherever y'all at but that was throw him up bust them up it looked just like that um but we got to talk about everything man we're gonna look at a lot of stats and again we're gonna evaluate everybody that contributed even like veterans like Benjamin St. Juice and Kendall Fuller but I'm mostly watching for the young guys while we're watching these games and has anybody does anybody even remember that Fedarian Mathis is on this team like come on dog also i want to point out the fact before we dive into this video that the jets had averaged 14.4 points per game this season and scored 30 on us with trevor simeon like they would average less than that if trevor simeon was their quarterback and we allowed them to score more than that with a worse quarterback than when they had that average average that's ridiculous also like why did that game feel so long the rams game the first half we breezed through that then the second half was long this game was long the whole time like what happened like we were almost like it was like 1 55 p.m when the first quarter ended what what was that like they literally just were trying to torture us with how long that game was but before we dive into everything we're going to talk about every position group we're going to talk about robert barry the enemy everything is this all sam howe's fault the fact that sam howe's been benched twice now is sam howell even gonna start for us going into this 49ers game or is that it for him are we just gonna continue to start him bench him start him bench him jacoby Brissett rally the team and then we barely lose is that just what was about to happen because i'm gonna tell you now the 49ers are not gonna rest their starters they're playing for playoff season right now the cowboys definitely aren't resting their starters if anything them losing to the bills the way that they did and the eagles struggling it's wide open for the top seeds for the nfc right now so those teams are going to go super hard on us they are not playing backups like how the cowboys did midway through the third quarter against us last year for the last game of the season the 49ers and cowboys are taking us very seriously just to warn you so i don't expect us to win those games i think we're finishing the season with four wins but we'll see but before we get ahead of ourselves we got to talk about even something interesting about the jets like makai beckton we need tackle he's a tackle he played for the Jets we just saw him today do you think he's worth the money that he may potentially get in free agency so we got to talk about all of that and more but before we do make sure you still follow that like button still follow the subscription button and still follow the bell next to that subscription button so you get a notification each and every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one make sure you stay tuned for all of the content this is not only just it I'm working on so much content we're doing mock drafts I'm working on my GM candidates video I'm gonna try to bring up at least like 20 and present why each one is a good candidate and then I'm gonna also pick my top at, at very least my top five maybe I'll even be able to pick my number one favorite guy I'm looking at G, um, head coaching candidates I'm gonna do a full breakdown similar to the GM video like that and also 
also for all of my channel members shouts out to all of the guys that became channel members today for the first time all my new members welcome to the street scores family i'm working on content exclusively for y'all as well we're going to take a look at not only draft prospects coming up that can help the commanders and i'm gonna show y'all why through the film but also players that are already on the commanders why certain players that are unrestricted free agents we need to resign them and also why certain players that are already on the team that are not unrestricted free agents why we need to build around them so all of that make sure i stay tuned for all of that more and without further ado let's go ahead and get to it let's get it he's our quarterback for the five ten years and i truly believe that All right, so of course, first of all, we got to start with the face of mediocrity himself, Ron Rivera, and even certain things that aren't necessarily directly his fault. If it's an overall bad thing for the team, and it's not specific to one side of the ball or one person, one position group. It's going under Ron Rivera because you are not only the head coach, but also the GM. I mean, even Martin Mayhew, who's, who's GM by title, has to check in with you to make sure that y'all make any moves that y'all make. So everything falls in Rivera's lap. Even things that aren't necessarily his fault, it, it, it falls in his lap. Also, speaking of Rivera... He just now had his press conference. He said that he's worried about how his confidence might get shaken in the second half. That's why he benched them. What? Also said Washington will evaluate the QB position between Howell and Brissett early this week. So he's not even sure. Like last game, he was like, yeah, Sam Howell's our quarterback. He'll start next week. We know that. And then during the middle of the, the, the week, like in practices and press conferences, he was kind of contradicting himself there. But now he's already saying we don't know. He's not even saying immediately after this game, like immediately after the Rams, that Sam Howell's going to start next week. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't. He said that he'll make a decision on QB early in the week, said he thinks Howell's confidence may have been shaken after a few lapses, whether his or others drops, which brings up a great point. A lot of this is not his fault. A lot of it is, but a lot of it is not. Sam Howell's just more than likely going to be the scapegoat. But like I've already said several times, it didn't matter if Sam Howell looked like a Hall of Famer this year. The next regime, GM, head coach, all of those guys have every right to get the quarterback that they they want they are not attached and, law and lawfully married to and obligated to keep Sam Howell it didn't matter how good he looked and with him not looking good whether it's his fault or not a mix of both the 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 next regime has every right to move on from him but then the fact that he's not look good just makes it even worse um but that's a Sam Howell thing we'll get there later but first of all two immediate drops led to an interception for Sam Howell Curtis Samuel with the first drop Logan Thomas with the next and we're gonna we're gonna bring that up later because Logan Thomas suddenly was able to catch everything thrown his way when Jacoby Brissett got in the game um also Sam Howell got sacked and then the punt got blocked and then it was an unblocked guy up the middle, which is crazy, which led to an immediate 10 to 0 start. Poor Sam Howell. We were already down 10 to 0, and it wasn't even his fault yet. You can say a lot of things that happened in this game were his fault, but we were down 10 to 0 before it really anything was. That was offensive line, that was bad special teams plays, that was defense, that was receivers and tight ends dropping passes. So we'll talk about Sam Howell soon and why some of it was his fault, a lot of it wasn't. And, you know, it, I mean, again, like I've been saying, we could debate whether or not Sam Howell should be the franchise quarterback or not, but I'm telling you now, based off of the sample size we've seen, especially since the Seahawks game, he will not be. I highly doubt he will be. I, like I said, even if he balls out, the next regime probably wants to bring in their own quarterback. They're not going to be like Jay Gruden had to deal with RG3 and Ron Rivera had to deal with Dwayne Haskins for a little bit. They're more than likely just going to go ahead and get their guy, scout their own guy, completely change up the offense, run a completely different offense, leave this West Coast offense behind, probably go to something else. You never know. But yeah, man, it was literally like 10 to 0. It wasn't his fault. So I'm putting that under the Rivera category. And also... Grant Paulson brought up a great point. We were at a certain point in the game at 1.16 p.m. in real life. We had a drop, a drop interception that led to an uh, a drop that led to an interception, gave up a field goal, wide receiver fell over while trying to catch a pass, three-yard run, sack for loss on 14, block punt. That was that whole situation where we were down 10 to 0. Um, also, to remind you, when that block punt happened, that was Terrell Burgess who's like leading the NFL in Pro Bowl votes as a special teamer right now, like literally the all pro special teamer guy right now that everybody feels like he's the best doing it. He was the reason that punt got blocked from what I remember. So that's just how bad we are. And then immediately, 
Um, we had a drop kickoff return immediately after we were down 10 to 0. That led to us starting at the seven yard line. That was bad. And then after a three and out, we had illegal touching on the commanders. So there that goes. Uh, and then Sam Howell finally completed his first pass with a little over nine minutes left in the first quarter. But we were already down 17 to 0 at that time. And when you hear nine minutes left in the first, you're like, oh, okay, maybe they didn't have the ball much. No, we had the ball at least three times, at least three drives minutes minimum at that point and he completed his first pass and then Jamison Crowder dog that fumble was crazy like as soon as the Jets finally started the jet and they started to look bad our defense finally started to get something going backed them up far made them punt and then Jamison Crowder has one of those momentum shifting returns it looks like oh okay the commanders might have something going on you know what I'm saying then he fumbles without anybody touching him and just literally throws it out uh, up instead of out like if, if he just fumbled and it went out of bounds we would start the ball he literally fumbled it perfectly for somebody to just come down and catch it for the Jets like it was like the worst case that the only thing he could have done worse is literally just hand the ball to a Jets player to throw it up instead of out is crazy literally looked like throw him up bust him up that was wild also, putting on fourth and three, Ron Rivera, we clearly see that you don't want to win, even though it felt like it towards the end of the game. When you put it on fourth and three, when we were down seven and we were in their territory, that's like, yeah, you don't want to win. What happened to Riverboat Ron that takes risk? You don't take any risk. Everything you've done since you've been here has been so safe. Arguably the safest coach I've seen coach the breaking your goal in my lifetime. Like, he, we were supposed to be this gambling, go forward on fourth downs, take risk guy. Everything from who we select in free agency, in the draft, how we manage games i'm surprised eugene shin hasn't already taken over but i guess he's just chilling back and watching for now um everything's been safe and I, I really hate that um also we started the game what zero of five on third downs it took till jacoby Brissett to come into the game to convert our first third down i think it, we may have started zero for seven somewhere around there it was bad um and then at a certain point the jets did the jet thing and turned the ball over for no reason like literally just within their own 15 yard line just no reason, just random fumble. I got to rewatch it to see how they even fumbled. It looks so stupid and silly. It just looks like the Jets jetting and, and trying to out-tank us, basically. They all know we want the draft pick. Then the commanders come out, we want the draft pick. But that Jets situation led to a uh, touchdown for us. And even after a touchdown that the Jets basically just hand-gifted us, uh, at a certain point, Derrick Henry had more passing touchdowns than the commanders had. Once we went into halftime, Derrick Henry had more passing touchdowns than we had most notably Sam Howell because he was the only quarterback that played at that point. Also, one weird thing about this game, we had so many offensive offsides called on us. Like, not false starts, and we had plenty of those as well. But we had, like, offensive offsides. Like, are we not trying at all? That means that you're offsides and you're ahead of the football before the ball is even snapped. It's not even like you move. You just, as we're lining up to snap the ball, you're just already too far ahead. It's like you didn't look down to see where the ball was. Like, just not trying at all. It was crazy. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on. I'm not going to spend too much time on Ron Rivera like I normally do. Eric Bieniemy. We could talk about so many things from this game, but the main thing I want to talk about is do you hate Sam Howell? Is that what it is? Because, like, that fourth and one call that had nothing to do with Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett, once Jacoby Brissett came into the game, we were in a fourth and one situation. He called a great play call to give Curtis Samuel the ball out of the backfield. And I think I remember seeing a play like that in training camp. And I don't feel like I've seen it all season up to that point from what I remember. And he just suddenly has this great, instead of running shotgunning and giving it to the running back on a halfback draw out of shotgun on fourth down, he actually called a really smart Kansas City Chiefs looking play call. Reach deep in his bag for it once Jacoby Brissett is in the game. And again, that play had nothing to do with Jacoby Brissett or Sam Howe. But for some reason, when, Sam, when Jacoby Brissett's in the game, Eric Benemy suddenly remembers how to call plays. Where has that been all season when we wanted to win games and not trying to get a top draft pick? Now moving on to quarterback. With all of the bad around him, I just don't understand. Like, it's a lot of bad that's not him. We're going to get to that. But it's also some bad that's him. Because at a certain point, even before he got benched, why did he target at best our fourth receiver in Byron Pringle versus one of the best corners in the NFL in Sauce Gardner? Like that was bad pre-snap decision making and post-snap decision making. Because if Sauce Gardner, the Jets' best corner easily, is on our fourth best receiver, that means the other three, at least two of them, are somewhere being guarded by somebody less capable. Somebody else is open. He also missed a few open receivers in the game. He had multiple batted down passes. It wasn't good. And he started one 
one for nine, 16 yards, one interception, one sack, and a zero quarterback ranking. And all rate my fault. And that one completion when he was one of nine was a Curtis Samuel screen that he threw behind the line of scrimmage. So it wasn't even like a completed, like a real actual NFL throw completed pass. Crazy. Then his second completion came two minutes and two seconds left in the first quarter, like our fourth or fifth possession. And that was a screen to Terry McLaurin as well. So he at a certain point was two for 10 and both of those completions were screens. Crazy. Uh, my boy Chu C brought up a great point though. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he kept saying that uh, Sam's fault the whole stream. So every time that it was clearly not Sam Hall's fault, the defense did something bad, the special teams did something bad, or if the rest of the offense, like a lot of receivers dropping passes, the offensive line not being able to block, he kept saying Sam's fault and that's it. I thought that was hilarious because again, we could blame Sam Howell for a few things like I just said, but this was definitely more of the team around Sam Howell than Sam Howell himself. But I also believe Sam Howell was not good, first of all, and he definitely wasn't good enough to make this regime second guess taking a quarterback in the first round. That's plain and simple. Again, we can argue about whose fault it is, whether or not Sam's or not. We could talk about that if you want to, but at the end of the day, we're moving on from Sam Howell. That's obvious now. He finished the first half 5 of 17, 43 yards, an interception, and a 15.1 quarterback ranking. It, I mean, Grant Paulson brings up a great point. 5 of 17 is really hard to do. It means two things are true. Howell is not taking enough layups, and he's bypassing too many checkdowns. But also, that's on the offensive coordinator as well. Eric Bieniemy needs to make things easier. And then when, Eric, when Jacoby Brissett comes into the game, things become easier. Versus the Rams, it was different. It seemed like we ran the same exact offense, but Jacoby Brissett just ran it better, more efficiently, was able to hit receivers while they were open and things like that. It felt like this game, the offense was different, though. Against the Rams, Jacoby Brissett somehow had the same offense as Jacoby Brissett just looked way better in it. Today, though, it looked like Eric Bieniemy enemy completely changed things in my opinion i'm not to look at the all 22 to see um but he did something different than that rams game now the first interception wasn't his fault but the second one was his fault and even though curtis samuel fell which kind of led to the interception he when you look at the replay he's staring down curtis samuel for the majority of that play which literally let the linebacker know oh he's about to throw the ball right here i might as well go ahead and try to make a play on it because i don't have to worry about a double move if he's watching him this whole time he's about to release this quickly especially with them having ptsd with the offensive line letting them down all season they watch tape just like we do prepare for the commanders they watch the old games that we played versus other teams like we do they know sam howell is shell shocked they know he's giddy he, he's ready to get the ball out of his hands as soon as possible so he literally was like there's nothing to worry about let me make a break on this play worst case scenario they catch it we're up 20 something to like seven i ain't worried about it so that is his fault um in, in a lot of ways for that you got to stop staring down receivers but at the same time curtis samuel fell um but when he got benched he was 6 of 22 58 yards and two interceptions that's terrible he only had one sack but jacoby Brissett at the same time came in and threw 13 passes and had no sack so the offensive line as bad as they were at the end of the day guys weren't getting sacked that that's sam howe's improved pocket presence that has actually improved one thing you can say is that sam howe has improved in the pocket um because even if you look at like his advanced stats, his problem the first few weeks wasn't even that the O-line was allowing a lot of pressures, like the most pressures in the NFL. It was a Sam Howell problem more than anything else. I presented these stats to you earlier. I forgot the exact stats. But basically the problem was is that every quarterback is pressured a certain amount of times. The problem with Sam Howell is that more of his pressures turned to sacks at a higher percentage than other quarterbacks that were pressured around the same amount. But for some reason, Sam Howell's pressures were more sacks. Everybody else's was just pressures be hits hurries or whatever um but yeah sam howell has now been benched for the second game in a row ron rivera has completely changed the quarterback conversation moving forward with his decisions over the past two weeks we are drafting a quarterback now first of all before we move on to jacoby Brissett, i do feel sorry for sam howell i feel like they did the best job to ruin him first of all eric bien why is he leading the nfl in passing attempts you're passing the ball with more with sam howell in his red shirt freshman year Red shirt rookie year, whatever you want to call it, because he only started one game last year, only played one game last year. So he's still technically a rookie, literally until up until the point that he's going against the Cowboys for the final game of the season. Then he would have already officially played a full game worth a full season worth of games. You're having a red shirt rookie basically throw more passes 
than you ever threw with Pat Mahomes. What does that say about that? Our run game has been efficient. We've had quite a bit of yards per carry. Like we actually have a pretty good yards per carry situation going on and you just refuse to throw it. I just don't understand. We had a 4.6 yards per rush, just like the, the Jets did. And we typically are somewhere above four, sometimes even at five. I mean, there was one game, Brian Robinson only had like six carries, but he was averaging like seven yards per carry or something like that. Eric Benmi, why are you choosing to make this as difficult for Sam Howell as possible in that way? Also, receivers and tight ends dropping passes left and right. Why? As soon as Jacoby Brissett comes into the game, y'all catching everything. Contested even. What, like, what was that? Uh, offensive line. I mean, y'all were pretty much just as bad for Sam Howell as y'all was Jacoby Brissett, but Jacoby Brissett just made it, did, made it seem like it wasn't. But still, y'all ruined Sam Howell. He has PTSD at this point because even though the offensive line has gotten better these last few games, Sam Howell has been worse. And I feel like a lot of it is because he's shell-shocked. The offensive line was bad the first half of the season. He was getting hit a lot, a lot. And I just feel like a lot of the problems he's having now with staring down receivers and getting the ball out of his hands too much, not seeing open receivers and just trying to get rid of the ball so he doesn't get hit even when there's no body coming at him, it's just PTSD at this point. So y'all did y'all best to ruin him. And then Ron Rivera benching him, starting him again, benching him again. Y'all are literally doing the best y'all can to ruin this quarterback. I really feel sorry for him. Now moving on to Jacoby Brissett, he came in and we converted our first third down of the game. I think we were one of eight at that point or something like that. One of seven maybe let me try to see if i can find it we finished three of 12 so yeah i think we were like zero of seven zero of eight at one point and then uh jacoby Brissett came in and converted the first one that's notable also we had the immediate passing touchdown in his first drive our first passing touchdown of the game and so now i'm questioning is jacoby Brissett gonna start versus the 49ers like is that a thing like i already said in the intro before the video like we got deep into the video before i actually played the intro for y'all it's like, I mean, at this point, starting Sam Howell doesn't do him much, much more favors because this next regime is already moving. You get benched twice. Like I said, Sam Howell could have looked like Pat Mahomes out there. This next regime maybe wouldn't have still kept him. But the way he's looked now, he's definitely done. It's, it's over with. Don't even, no more debates about whether we should or should not let Sam Howell be the franchise quarterback. I highly doubt he will be regardless of how he looks even against the 49ers and Cowboys at this point. So y'all just ruined that. So at this point, it's like whether you start him or not, what benefit does it do, does it do anybody? I feel like the only benefit to starting Sam Howell at this point is that maybe he can ball out enough to where we can use him as trade bait to send somewhere else. Because again, I feel like it's already a done deal. He's not going to be our franchise quarterback. At best, we'll draft the quarterback in the first round, and then him and Sam Howell will be allowed to compete for the starting quarterback role immediately. But I'm pretty sure they're going to lean towards that the, the drafted quarterback, even if he's slightly worse than Sam Howell in the offseason. They're just going to win and doubt, give it to him. Sam Howell's not only a fifth-round pick, but a fifth-round pick from the previous regime. The new regime is going to want to go with their quarterback as soon as possible, and they're going to hope that he looks like how C.J. Stroud looked this year. Um, but... Yeah, man, it just kind of doesn't matter outside of the fact that maybe Sam Howell, if he somehow balls out these last two games, we can um, it can increase his uh, his draft, uh, his trade value. Um, also, Jacoby Brissett does nothing for us balling out. Because, like, okay, speaking of trade value, him balling out, him winning us that game potentially only makes us lose draft picks. That's it. Also, he's an unrestricted free agent. It'd be different if Jacoby Brissett at least had another year on his contract after this season ended, but he doesn't. So him balling out for us, we can't even like trade him away for a draft pick like we should have done before the trade deadline, like I thought we would have done, but we didn't. So him literally balling out does nothing for the Burgundy and Gold. It's good for him. It potentially gets him a better contract later uh, in the offseason for another team, but it doesn't do anything for us. Um, also... I mean, just to bring it up, these are my points. I agree with Ben Standig here. Jacoby Brissett replaces Sam Howell leading Washington to a win would, would also be a double loss. The Howell hype train is in a ditch and the number four pick goes bye-bye. Uh, so winning does nothing for us because if anything, winning makes it less likely to get a guy to replace Sam Howell. So it's just it's just crazy, man. I mean, like, honestly, some people were saying pride. You, you root to win for your team no matter what pride. Okay, I can see that. You beat the 49ers, I can see you take some of that momentum and pride with you to the offseason. You beat the Cowboys, 
you can take some of that momentum and pride with you to the offseason. But just like that 7-9 season where we went to the playoffs and that sent us back like eight draft picks for no reason. And we missed out on better players because of it. Which was just like we basically fell flat on our face and barely slid into that playoffs. I don't count that as all, at all. Don't even bring that up when people say Ron Rivera led us to the playoffs at least one year while he was here. That was pointless. Similar to that, what pride do we get in beating the Trevor Simeon-led Jets? What pride is that? What GM or head coach is looking like, oh, man, they beat the Jets? Okay. I might want to go there, coach. Let's talk about potential free agents like football players. Brian Burns, for example. Oh, they beat the Jets? Barely? Trevor Simeon, the starting quarterback? Yeah, I want to go play. Like, what What pride is in there? I'm just, I would understand, and I disagree. Even if we beat the 49ers or Cowboys, I still disagree. But I can see the pride argument, at least there. I don't see it for the Jets at all. They had the 32nd ranked offense in the NFL. 32nd, dead last, and we allowed them to score 30 points. We win that game, well, if they would have scored 27 and we won. We win that game, what pride? What does that teach us going into the offseason? Like, oh, yeah, we can do this. Like, what kind of rally is that? Um, also, if we would have lost that game, I hope that pride that y'all love can draft Olu Fashanu. Because a draft pick wouldn't be able to. Hopefully, you know, that pride is a currency we can use at the draft to draft an elite player like Brock Bowers, Olufashanu, or a quarterback that we need. I'm just saying, you know, hopefully that's what it is. Also, Greg Rosenthal, who's not a Commanders fan at all in any way, tweeted, Washington probably should have won the Super Bowl if Jacoby Brissett started all season. He said we would have won the Super Bowl. My fault. Um, and that's just funny that people that aren't even Commanders fans are even looking at like, man, Jacoby Brissett got this offense going. Moving on, running back wise, Chris Rodriguez was great today, man. This was his best game easily because even against the Rams, he had some good moments, but he also had some bad moments when you really look back at the game. He left a lot of yards on the field, but today, yards after contact uh, was like with eight minutes, 30 seconds left in the first quarter. He had like a great run. Um, then he had a hard earned touchdown. I think he ended up having two. Or no, he had one. I think Antonio Gibson had the other, but he was running really well and had his best game in his short career in that second half. He was hurdling people and everything. And then Antonio Gibson was coming in and doing his thing as well. And for though a lot of us, I think the majority of the fan base, you know, we want this draft pick and all. We want a better draft pick and want to lose and want other teams to win and stuff like that. So a lot of us were in the chat, it was funny. We were like, man, Gibson fumbles all the time when we don't want him to. This man runs out of bounds when we don't want him to and we're trying to win games and we're trying to run out the clock. Why? Well, I mean, he's due for that this game, right? when we want it to happen but he didn't that was funny wide receiver wise i'm about to look at the all 22 later but when sam howell was in the game it felt like no receivers were open and i feel like other than screens every receiver howell had thrown to was locked up penalty or not some of them were penalties though like the one on terry McLaurin in like the first quarter was crazy they didn't call it then they called that crazy mess against benjamin st juice later on ridiculous um but my point is again the argument of whether it's sam howell's fault or everybody else's fault around him is probably a mix of both was how not seeing the open guys and, and like the guys that were open he just wasn't seeing them or getting it to him in time or were guys just not getting open or was it both and i again for everything dealing with sam howell i think it's a mix of both his fault and everybody else's fault around no matter what you're talking about Eric enemy receivers offensive line whoever I think it's a mix of both but as soon as jacoby Brissett comes in suddenly everybody's open suddenly terry mclaurin's unlocked he looks like a top 10 receiver again it's crazy he didn't get his third catch of the game until jacoby Brissett came into the game which is absolutely wild there's no reason that should ever happen and he finished the game with only three receptions and five targets so that was the last reception he had he had two with sam howell one with jacoby Brissett. but that's still ridiculous uh, I mean, even Jacoby Brissett coming in, we started to unlock Terry McLaurin, but he only had one recession from Jacoby Brissett. So let's not act like Terry McLaurin is suddenly just the best receiver of all time with Jacoby Brissett's in the game. Also, moving on to tight ends, Logan Thomas and John Bates dropping every pass when Sam Howell is in the game. Wide open. But then suddenly Jacoby Brissett comes into the game. He makes a contested catch for a touchdown. Jacoby Brissett is out there. I mean, um, John Bates made a contested catch for a first down when Jacoby Brissett came into the game what was that but then he dropped the touchdown uh thank goodness which wasted some of the clock but still come on dog offensive line wise andrew wiley got hurt so trent scott came in to finish the game and of course charles leno was out before the game even started so we had cornelius lucas at left tackle trent scott at right tackle just to let you know and man the offensive line was struggling i mean there was some plays where sadiq charles was getting pushed literally into sam howell's lap he had nowhere to throw it was so sad moving on to defensive coordinator 
I think this is one of our worst missed tackle games ever, dog. Garrett Wilson, I mean, that one time he caught the ball for five yards on third and 10 and then broke multiple tackles to pick up a first down. I felt like he did that like three or four times. Their tight end did that like twice. This is one of our worst tackling games ever. Their running backs, Brees Hall, breaking tackles, turning third and 10s to first and 10s after getting the ball within like five yard lines five yards of the line of scrimmage it was crazy this is one of our worst tackling performances i feel like i've ever seen i feel like it's underrated and people didn't really notice because we were actively rooting for us to lose i guess but like this was terrible tackling today man i feel like that's not being noticed enough also to the antonio gibson point we've had we've been blowing coverages all year and when we need to blow coverages the most we're not ready like, we just don't do it. Suddenly, our secondary is locked up at least deep down the field. Because Trevor Simeon didn't throw a pass of 10 yards or more all game, I believe. The commentator said that, like, halfway through the fourth quarter, and I don't even think he completed one by the end of the game. A lot of it was just yards after catching things like that. That's crazy. D-line-wise, I mean... Deron Payne got hurt. He came back. Jonathan Allen. I'm about to look at the All-22 to really judge them. The only thing I'm going to say is, does Fedarian Mathis still only have one tackle this season? He's played in enough games, dog. He's played in enough games. I don't want to hear nothing about him being hurt. Yeah, he missed a few games, but he still has one tackle. This man has played in how many games this season? Five? He's played in five games this season, minimum four. And our second round pick has one tackle tackle y'all i want that to be noticed uh moving on from defensive line we not even about to stay there there kj henry has some good moments like he set the edge really well especially on those those uh those last couple of drives with the jets where they were trying to take the lead and win the game uh he was really disciplined with his edge setting and trying to get to the quarterback instead of going rogue like a lot of people complain about Montez Sweat and chase young doing he made sure he, he like looked like he was going to go inside trevor simeon tried to go out he came back and then trevor simeon had to throw it out of bounds oh yeah trevor simeon was just trying to get intentional ground in every drive it looked like it felt like they only called like two, but it looked like he had like five that should have been called. And that was one of the plays where it looked like you had an argument to call it. Moving on to linebacker, when Khalid Hudson is on the sideline and Jamin Davis is on IR, we have no speed in the second level. Barton was getting outran by Trevor Simeon one of those plays like literally running faster than come on dog and i'm surprised i was just surprised they weren't running sweeps tosses and, and stretch plays all game because we had no speed at the second level with the linebackers if khalid Hudson's on the sideline which he was a lot it felt like in the second half he played more but it felt like in the first half david mayo and cody barton were out there a lot the majority of the time and david mayo ended up banged up and hobbling off the sideline maybe that's why khalid Hudson started playing which is stupid because khalid Hudson should have been starting from the jump again we're already eliminated from the playoffs so what is winning do for us so at the very least what you could do is give these younger guys more opportunities to show what they could do because david mayo is not going to be here next year and even if he is he he shouldn't be starting so what does this what does this regime need to see in david mayo where's the potential there was Kali cuts and the more snaps he gets the better he can play and then he actually played well which is just another walking contradiction itself Kali cuts and not only looked better than david mayo but he's younger than david mayo so it's a win-win with him on the field i don't get it if you want to win Kali cuts is your answer if you want to evaluate the young talent to see who you need to build around and see, I mean, my whole point in the stream was all of the young guys, including including Khalid Hudson, what you're doing these last few games of this season is showing the next regime how much they need to prioritize your position group. Do we need to go linebacker in Khalid Hudson's case early in the draft? Do we need to go pay a top guy in free agency or do we just need to get some depth like for some cheap money in free agency or a guy later in the draft like day three or something that's what these guys are out there to prove at multiple position groups kj henry is an edge rusher how much do we need to prioritize edge rusher in the offseason i'm saying go get brian burns for whatever money he's asking for but that's just me caught Quan martin emmanuel forbes a lot of these guys that's my whole point so it's like bro why was Khalid hudson not playing more like what, what is the disadvantage to him being out there at this point at all also why is jabril cox not playing on defense still what do we have to lose even if we weren't tanking, even if we were trying to win, our linebackers were so bad that how much worse can Jabril Cox be? Even say we have eight wins right now, we're trying to make the playoffs. How much worse can Jabril Cox be than what we had in David Mayo out there running around with for no reason? Just, just literally doing cardio. But shouts out to him because Jabril Cox at least made some plays in special teams. So his name, we heard the commentator say it, he was noticed. But can we give my boy some playing snaps on defense? What does it hurt us? What did we lose from playing Jabril Cox at this point? But yeah, Khalid Cutson balled out though. That, that man was balling. He had that clutch coverage play to force the Jets to end up punting 
and they gave us the ball back. We still ended up losing after the next possession the Jets went on. But, man, Khalid Hudson was balling in coverage. He was balling against the run. He wasn't perfect. I'm not going to say or act like he was an all-pro or a Pro Bowl player, but he looked better than what I'm used to seeing from my linebackers this season. He's definitely flashed. Also, shouts out to Cody Barton for getting that interception in the red zone. That boy is like, hey, man, I'm an unrestricted free agent. Look at me, next regime, next GM, next head, next head coach, Eugene Shin, Josh Harris. Look at me. I'm getting interceptions in the red zone. I'm a playmaker. Shouts out to Cody Barton for that. Also, the Khalid Hudson situation, like I said, on that third down and long where he made that great coverage play that almost won us the game, basically. It was hilarious how many Commanders fans were screaming, no, that's P.I. That I've never seen Commanders fans want a pass in the fans called on a commander's defensive player so bad everybody was like no that's pi that's gotta be pi come on refs that was hilarious moving on the corner uh kendall fuller had great coverage every time i noticed him again all 22 is going to tell you everything so these this is a live instant reaction after the game so who knows if kendall fuller was actually that good but every time i noticed him from my live first watch and i was busy i, lo I was all over the place checking the chat trying to read it and reply to as many comments as possible so i didn't see everything but i mean that that touchdown deflection he had on garrett wilson in the first quarter was amazing i think that was the first defensive possession we started the drive within our own 15 yard line after with a fumble or something like that. So I forgot what happened. I don't even remember, man. Uh, also, St. Juice, poor guy, because he was abused in the run game. He was getting handsy in the passing game. And then he got hurt and was out for the rest of the game. Which takes me to the point that Emmanuel For Forbes, first snap, your first round pick, that Ron Rivera loves so much that Ron Rivera doesn't want to play for some reason. Emmanuel For Forbes. And it's just like, okay. We're going to get to it, but Emmanuel Forbes' first snap came after Benjamin St. Juice got hurt with 7 minutes, 35 seconds left in the third quarter. And that was literally the play before Cody Barton got that interception in the red zone. But even beyond the contradiction that I keep bringing up with Khalid Hudson, like what are we trying to do? What is the disadvantage of playing Emmanuel Forbes? If anything, the more he plays, the better he'll potentially be moving forward to next year. But at the very least, Ron Rivera, be selfish. Be like, okay, I spent the first round pick on this guy. This is my guy. We didn't take... Deontay Banks and Chris Rodriguez, uh, Chris, uh, my fault, Kristen Gonzalez for this guy. At the very least, be selfish and be like, well, I'm not going to admit he was a bad draft pick. I'm going to keep playing him as if he wasn't. Maybe something will click. He's not even trying to save himself. Like, he's the, like, I don't even understand any logic to Emmanuel Forbes not getting a single snap in this game until Benjamin St. Juice got out there. And to make it even worse, exactly like Khalid Hudson compared to David Mayo and Cody Barton. Emmanuel Forbes came out there and was great. He he shut down anything coming his way. There's literally no sense to why Emmanuel Forbes... Like, that's, again, the most passionate I've ever been about something that's upset me about Ron Rivera. This contradiction of not playing the younger guys is literally only hurting the future of this franchise. He's not doing us any favors besides the losing and giving us a better draft pick. Why are Quan Martin, Emmanuel Forbes, KJ Henry, Khalid Hudson, Percy Butler not playing as much as possible on the defense why why is chris rodriguez antonio gibson even if brian robinson's healthy sam howe chris paul all these younger guys cole turner can we, why is cole turner inactive if he's healthy or at the very least even if he's active why is he not getting the ball why are we doing this why are these younger guys not getting more opportunities I've already broken down why they need to, but this is just ridiculous. That's the thing that makes me want Ron Rivera fired the most. The fact that he's not letting the young guys play as much as possible. You cut Danny Johnson, which doesn't make your secondary better. It doesn't make your team better. So that's clearly, okay, we're trying to get rid of one of the veterans to give some of these younger guys more chances to show what they can do for the next regime. But then you sign Kiyu Blue Kelly and don't play him. Or Emmanuel Forbes. I, I'm so confused, man. I just don't get it. Can, can Emmanuel Forbes get a few snaps? Dog. And man, my boy Brian Butler in the chat while we was live streaming, people were asking what was that thing on Emmanuel Forbes' elbow. He, my boy Brian Butler said that was a weight gain patch. <laughs> that was so stupid, man. Safety, we gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, not much to talk about. Camera curl was decent. That's one of those things. Safety is really hard to judge. You gotta look at the All-22 to truly understand whether they had a good game or not. I didn't know, notice, well, I mean, we didn't allow any big plays. We didn't have any coverage, but so I'm assuming Camera curl, Percy Butler, Quan Martin, if he was back there at any time, did their jobs. I don't know i don't want to tell you a lie and make up some stuff so i'm about to look at the all 22 to find out a real answer maybe i'll do another game review video later on during the week after i get to check up on some things like that and then before we get up out of here special teams tress way 
had one of his best punts ever in the first quarter. I felt like a lot of people didn't notice it, but the way a lot of people were giving De'Ami Brown credit, credit for catching at the one-yard line, but he punted that thing. It landed at the one-yard line. It fell straight up. Literally any special teams player's dream to just sit there and catch the ball at the one-yard line and down it right there. That was one of Tressway's best punts I've ever seen, dog. And I felt like it kind of went unnoticed, so I wanted to shout him out for that. Hey, I guess Cameron Cheeseman being gone allows him to get back to his normal self, his best player, the team self that we act like he is. Uh, also, the entire special teams unit felt like they were trying to tank, bro. It was everybody, the blocking, the returning. I mean, Jamison Crowder had his worst returning game I've ever seen from him, whether it be him playing for the Burgundy and Gold under the Redskins name or the Commander's name. I don't know what that was. Like... Imagine how bad the special teams would have been if Cameron Cheeseman was out there as well, dog. That could have gotten really bad. Shout out to Joey Sly for making all of his extra points because Cameron Cheeseman wasn't there. None of them blocked. Also, hey, man, shouts out to Greg Zerline. I'm a guy that wants a top draft pick. So, hey, man, never doubted you. You're my hero, man. Shouts out my boy Greg the Leg, man. Also... Somebody make sure y'all go ahead and send Greg the leg as many Christmas presents as y'all can. Somebody find out his information. We need to get that man something. Also, before we get up out of here, Makai Becton. He's an unrestricted free agent for the Jets coming up. I remember I wanted him real bad in the draft coming out of Louisville. But he had a bad game today. I'm not going to lie. And he hasn't been that great so far in his short NFL career since he's been there. Because um, he has several penalties. Like false starts, holdings, everything. And then he got beat on plays even where he wasn't penalized. So is he worth a shot in free agency? How do y'all feel about it? Because I think his market value right now is set to like 13 million. Do you think he's worth that? I'm not sure. That's just one of my, you know, I'm trying to always think of a random question to pose to y'all before we get up out of here so that we can get some debates and discussion in the comment section. That's the, the question I'm gonna leave to y'all. But of course, that's the end of this video. Let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video, but especially that Makai Becton part. Let me know how you feel about Sam Howell. Is it his fault? Eric Bienemy's fault? The receiver's not getting open, offensive line, whatever. Let me know how you feel about the defense, special teams, everything. Do you think this was bad enough for Jamison Crowder to no longer have a seat with this regime next year? He's an unrestricted free agent. Maybe they don't bring him back just simply because of how bad he was this game, trying to play, throw him up, bust him up in the middle of the game. I don't know what that was. Um, also, of course, let me know the Makai Becton situation. Of course, make sure you stiff arm that like button on the way out, stiff arm that subscription button, and stiff arm the bell next to that subscription button so you get a notification each and every time I release these videos, whether informative or opinionated, I appreciate y'all. Shouts out to my channel members again. I'm working on content exclusively for y'all. So I really appreciate y'all. I'm working on more videos, GM candidates, head coaching candidates. I'm going to update y'all on a Pro Bowl guys that are currently on our team. Some guys that may potentially make the Pro Bowl, including Terrell Burgess, who literally tried to sell this game today, which is crazy. Kind of did. Uh, also, I have so many video ideas, so stay tuned. Um, I have some more Josh Harris updates. I'm going to catch y'all later. I'm out. Oh!